This is the Janet Killeen Books Podcast. I'm reading from my collection of short stories, There is a Season. This story is called Not for Ourselves Alone. All the bright hopes of peace and the urgency of survival hummed in the whirling wheels of huge perambulators travelling to the shops and to the park down the rise, past the careful gardens bright with aubretia, the gables of Tudor black and white, the cherry and crabapple trees, a sparkling crisp world of beauty and neatness, and the empty sockets of bomb damage were daily being healed. As her eyes learned to focus and her mind to absorb impressions, she learned the rhythms of her world. The baker's van, the postman, the coalman and his horse and cart, a man of wonder with white-rimmed eyes in his coal-dust face, who tipped the shiny coal sacks quick with a roar into the coal bunker. Daddy and all daddies left for the eight o'clock train to town in the morning, bowler hat, and leather briefcase. Home at six, and sometimes the excitement of waiting at the station for his train, with the strange smell of static electricity suspended in the air, as the rails vibrated and the doors opened all along the train's green sides, and shut with that heavy, metallic thud. The routines created safety, for a world lately torn apart. Familiar patterns and carefully, unconsciously mimicked lives. At three years old, the mysterious arrival of a baby brother. Suddenly, like a compass needle, the household shifted its direction, and she, like the quivering needle's tip, pointed most truly towards him. She was his trailblazer, first to climb the apple tree, to squeeze through forbidden railings, to push the swing harder, to try school and report back, and to create the stories that long after lights out held them squealing with delight in their shared room. She had a sense of radiance in those days, of serving gladly the supreme importance of this brother. She herself did not lack love, Her parents took her swimming and sent her to brownies and expressed their pride in all that she achieved at school. Somehow, summers lasted long and winters fled away, leaving only memories of Christmas and Guy Fawkes and twice snow deep enough for sledging behind them. She must have been ten when she first heard of the grammar school. Right overall, though not interested in arithmetic, she heard the note of strain. She will pass her eleven plus. Do we need to get her some coaching in arithmetic? It mattered to them. She began to discriminate between the tones in which they described the future. Of course, she went to the grammar school. She went, and the voice dropped, to the secondary modern. Sitting up straighter in the classroom rows and chewing the ends of her pencils and pen holder with earnestness, she applied herself to understand and practice. Around her now she sensed the same tension and saw in some children a shrug of failure as they visibly slid away from the core of the classroom. It was the season of the bicycle. David, two desks behind, was the first to speak it out. If I pass the 11 plus, my parents are going to buy me a bicycle. It rippled through the class. And me, and me. A bicycle. Like a dream, she thought. She took the dream home, not daring to give words to it, in case it vanished like a bubble touched with a clumsy finger. She sat through children's hour, hoping, hugging the thought to herself. Perhaps at breakfast on Saturday when they had family time and listened to children's favourites with Uncle Mac, perhaps she might just say, some of my class are talking about getting a bicycle this year, or 
If I work really hard and do well at school, do you think I might have a bicycle for my birthday? I'll save all my pocket money, or... But it didn't matter how many times she rehearsed it. It could not emerge from her mouth. So great was the longing. Neither that Saturday nor any other. She whispered the secret to her brother, his eyes shining like hers with excitement. Don't tell, it's our secret. And then, one Saturday in March, they said it. She saw them smile at each other across the table, and then Daddy said, You've done so well at school, Elizabeth. We wondered if you'd like a bicycle if you pass your 11 plus. We so hope you will get a place at the grammar school. That very afternoon, they all went down the high street to the shop, Meredith's, specialists in rally and BSA bicycles. She moved among the machines, stroking the bright-spoked wheels, touching the leather saddles, the handlebar grips, the Sturmy Archer gears with the magic thumb-sized lever and the brakes with their complicated wire cords. Drop or straight handlebars? Which colour? Wine red, green or blue for the sporting models? And on the wall, saddlebags, transfer kits, handlebar bells, water flask carriers. It captured her with a promise of movement, of a freedom which she had barely begun to imagine. The rows of desks, the pacing invigilation, the way her hand seemed to have its own life, moving under her eyes along the page. Each day passed numbly for her, and she struggled to believe that there was hope. It was a long time, it seemed, before the official terse letter came from the education authority. Your daughter, Elizabeth, has been awarded a place at the grammar school. Then all was transformed as if colour flooded back into the world. The shining, wine-red Raleigh bicycle, complete with saddlebag, stood in the garage, its wheels poised for every adventure. And in a rush, the summer holidays ended with visits to the school outfitter for uniform. Solemn lists. Jim Slip. White blouses, tie, blazer, beret, hockey boots, airtex blouses, navy knickers, game shorts. Endless, exciting, strange garments in which she stood self-conscious and proud on the hearthrug before her admiring parents and her brother. The school motto on the blazer, non nobis solum. Not for ourselves uh, alone, her father said, clearing his throat as he remembered his schoolboy Latin. She looked at her brother, playing with his herald cowboys and Indians in the corner, and he grinned at her as she stood awkwardly in the stiff navy blazer and the box pleats of the gym slip. Non nobis solum. Those first few days were bewildering to her. Instructions, timetables, Corridors, new and astonishing subjects and teachers. Stand up when the teacher enters the room. Good morning, girls. Assembly, games, the science laboratory, Latin, a weighted satchel. Confusion for days, until some of the faces and voices became familiar, and she found she belonged at her own desk in the form room. She had stayed late after school that afternoon in order to join the choir. All heads swivelled as the headmistress came into the hall and they stumbled up from the floor to stand before her. A quiet word with the teacher and then she was called forward. I'm afraid there has been some sad news at home, my dear, she said. Elizabeth noticed how she blinked and swallowed so unlike the imperious woman who led assembly. Even as her stomach cringed and legs shook with weakness, she noticed details. The autumn afternoon light on the top of the grand piano, the flicker of that same sun catching the gilding on the school crest above the door. The girls hushed, unnaturally still, 
watching her slow movements as she turned to follow the headmistress. Her own right shoelace half undone. The ink, blue-black, staining her writing fingers. A teacher took her home in a pale green Ford Prefect. The sickening smell of petrol and leather lived in her nostrils for weeks. When it was all over, they tried so hard to be kind to her. Although each parent was locked inside grief that had no possible key for her to turn, she went back to school, aware of whispering and fumbled sympathy, but seeing only her books as a place of refuge. At home, after homework and helping with the supper things, she fled to her small room above the porch. You're getting too old to share with your brother now, dear. It'll be nice for you to have your own room, they had said more than a year ago, to read. One evening in January, old friends came to visit her mother. When she had excused herself and gone upstairs, she crept back along the landing, drawn somehow to hear and understand the grieving of the adult world to which she was denied entry. Fragments of strained voices came to her from the front room. Her mother's friend. My dear, I am so very sorry. Her mother's voice. We had such hopes for him. So bright and quick. He could have achieved anything, the teachers said. Yes, it was her bicycle. He rushed home from school and took it before I knew. Elizabeth was staying late at school, else it could never have happened. I think he only took it to show her how well he could ride straight out in front of a car. Then the terrifying sounds of adult weeping and the muffled offered consolation. Hearing and perfectly understanding at last, calm now with resolution. She felt her way back along the darkened landing to her room. She pushed aside and closed the early pages of Jane Eyre and reached for her science textbook, frowning over the chapter they had begun in class that day. And so began her endless, unspoken reparation. You have been listening to not for ourselves alone. From the book There is a Season. Read by the author Janet Killeen. And produced by Duncan P.B. For more stories, please subscribe on iTunes or from wherever you get your podcasts.